All right, so why is Parkinson so hard to study? Um, first of all, we're getting to it late. Uh, so by the time you're diagnosed, you've already had this disease for a decade or two. It is virtually impossible for an epidemiologist to go back to, oh, it must have been that time you mowed the lawn um, after your neighbor used this pesticide to put out the dandelions on their lawn. I mean, there are things that we can start to find some things that people with Parkinson's have in common, both to increase and decrease the risk. Um, but the, the sheer fact that we are getting to the, we don't even know you have the disease until you've had it for a decade or two, really handicaps epidemiologists in their ability to find um, common variables, like things that could have caused this in the first place. Right? There is something that is knocking over the first domino. Um, there is a trigger, there are exposures, there may be infectious agents, but the problem is they are early, right? They're going to come when this disease starts. We don't diagnose Parkinson's until you've had it for a decade or two. So we are making it really hard on ourselves because we are getting to this disease so late. It is virtually impossible for epidemiologists to make sense of um, what exposures might have been happening at the time this disease was initiated. So one of the huge, huge obstacles that faces Parkinson's disease right now is how late we are getting to this disease. So truly meaningful change is going to happen when we are able to identify people with premotor Parkinson's disease or prodromal Parkinson's disease. I think that the next wave of really um, paradigm shifting research for people with Parkinson's disease is going to be that which focuses on enrolling, identifying and enrolling people who aren't yet diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, that we use the diagnosis of Parkinsonism as an outcome measure perhaps. And the people that we're actually working with to do interventions are people who have REM sleep behavior disorder and loss of smell and things that are kind of like, hey, heads up, you're at increased risk, how do we work with those folks? So. Truly earth-shattering advancement in Parkinson's disease progression slowing, I think, is going to happen when we kind of address the next generation, the people who already have Parkinson's right now and they don't yet know we have it. And I do think that there are a lot of efforts being made in that direction. So this is a tremendously diverse disease. So when we talk about heterogeneity, we mean a couple different things. One, the symptom picture within this condition, this disease, is very, very different from person to person. If you take 100 people with Parkinson's disease, each one of them has some overlap in their symptoms, but a very different version of what they call Parkinson's disease. For some people, in clinic when I ask people what is most debilitating, um, I will often start a clinic visit by saying, hey, if I could make three or four of your symptoms disappear, um, where would you have me start? Which of your Parkinson's symptoms are most debilitating? And some people will say tremor, other people will say fatigue, other people will say sleep, other people will say balance. Um, so, so each person's version of this disease and what they find most debilitating varies. Um, also, falling under the heading heterogeneity, is this huge, huge difference in how fast somebody's Parkinson's progresses. There are people who are in a wheelchair a couple years after diagnosis. There are people who are thriving 20 years after diagnosis. We cannot predict, or we have historically not been able to predict, who are those people who have better outcomes over time. Why not, you ask? <laughs> Seems like a pretty logical question. Who are those people who are doing well? So, so one thing that you will hear me say a lot is this frustration with um, the, the people who fund research studies, review committees, the larger scientific community who sits and determines whose grants get funded have largely favored explanative research. Um, they are most interested in investing in research that helps them understand the mechanism of action for Parkinson's. On a cellular level, how do we explain what's happening? When they ask the question, what's going on here? They're going on a cellular level to try and figure out what's happening inside, inside the intestinal cells, inside the neurons. 
When I look at Parkinson's research and I say what's going on here, um, I like to start from what's called a patient-centered perspective. Um, the thing that I care about is that a patient who has been diagnosed with Parkinsonism says, I do not have the symptoms associated with Parkinsonism, right? Because Something that's common to um, the integrative medicine community is this idea that medicine should be personalized. It's not a one-size-fits-all. I mean, we already talked about um, how, it's, how likely inaccurate it is that we're getting the umbrellas right. Uh, the other thing that I talked about in terms of a problem with studying Parkinson's disease, the other thing that I, I haven't had a chance to dive into is this idea that we aren't enrolling the right people in clinical trials. Um, the whole point of a clinical trial is to ask the question, if we were to do this to real people with Parkinson's in society, can we expect similar results. Can we see the improvement? If we get a benefit in this cohort of 150 people, um, we can predict that it will probably translate to improvement in society. Well, that's great, but for that to be true, we have to enroll people in our studies who are a lot like the people we're trying to serve in the community. And we're failing. We're failing terribly for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, um, people who live in, in urban centers are more likely to have access to research. People who live in rural communities are going to be less eligible to and, and have less access to participating in clinical trials. Um, the more well-educated a person, the more likely they are to participate in research studies. So what we end up doing is finding in our clinical trials, we have a whole bunch of uh, well-educated people in higher income brackets because they have more disposable time. Um, they ha it's easier for them to take a cab to a research center. It's easier for them to navigate the system. They're more um, they tend to be more well educated and can navigate some of these systems a lot easier. So um, poorly educated people in rural communities tend to be very poorly represented. The other thing that happens um, ethically, uh, you don't want to enroll people who can't consent, right? And so uh, it, it is often easier for a clinician to just say, we're not going to enroll people who are cognitively impaired. We are not going to enroll people who are mentally unwell. And so it makes my life so much easier as a researcher if we just get a, rid of this population of people who muddy the waters. Um, so, so that's a common practice in, in clinical trials is to get rid of people who, who add some murkiness to things. For instance, mild cognitive impairment or dementia. However, the people with Parkinson's that we're trying to help absolutely have mental illnesses, have histories of addiction, have uh, mild cognitive impairment, have early symptoms of dementia. So when, as soon as we start excluding those people because they complicate our study design, we make it less likely that the results are actually going to translate to those people. We hope that they do, but it's not realistic that we're going to go through and do a study with that cohort later. We just want a clean study that gets us positive results and hope it'll work on everybody in the real world. And so as we, as we design cleaner and cleaner studies, what we end up doing is um, diminishing the likelihood that the results that we find in this nicely controlled, clean environment actually translate to the populations we're trying to help. So there's also a huge difference between what is good, promising, exciting science and what the media picks up on. If I scroll through my Facebook feed or look at Twitter or social media, um, even BBC and New York Times, it is amazing to see the buzz and the stir that can be created by an exciting title. Um, you can have a fancy, clever one-liner that, that results in half of patients coming in and asking their doctors about, uh, I read coconut oil is bad for you, should I stop? I mean, it is so easy for the media to influence the thinking of the Parkinson's community, and so I would really, really, I, I mean, I want you to stay 
in touch with the research. I want you to read what's coming out, but I want you to realize that um, the correlation between what the media picks up on and what is ultimately going to come to fruition and be something that's useful to you, um, there's a schism there. Um, those two things don't necessarily go hand in hand. 